Hi, uh, I'm Eric. I'm a designer at ThoughtBot, uh, and this is my talk. If it's interactive, it needs a focus style. Thank you for attending. So I figured I'd start things off with a uh, polarizing statement. Uh, single page applications ultimately render as HTML. And because of this, we still need to ensure that anything interactive on the web has focus styles applied to it. Uh, for some reason, some people seem to think that just because you're using fancy JavaScript to route things, that you're somehow ex exempt from making your content accessible. Uh, that is false. So moving on. Uh, this is the Mona Lisa by Italian Renaissance painter Leonardo da Vinci. Uh, it's a priceless work of art, easily one of the most famous paintings ever created. So two questions I want to ask you. Is it beautiful and is it useful? Beautiful, yes. Uh, da Vinci was a master of his medium. The subject's enigmatic expression has inspired generations of tribute, imitation, parody, and analysis. Useful uh, from a societal perspective, undoubtedly. Um, however, it's just a wooden panel with some paint applied to it. Fragile, brittle, and needs a controlled environment and constant conservation efforts. What can we do with that? Not a whole lot. This is a leg splint made by the husband and wife design team Charles and Ray Eames. Uh, they were commissioned by the US Navy during World War II to design a lightweight splint to get wounded soldiers out of the field without causing additional injuries. Uh, the metal splints of that period weren't secure enough to hold the legs still, uh, causing unnecessary traumatic injury from, and death from things like gangrene, shock, and blood loss. Is it beautiful? Um, I think so. The molding followed the contours of the human leg, giving the splint a flowing organic shape. Uh, this molding technique was later used by the Eames to make both sculpture and furniture, including the Eames chair. Uh, you might have heard, it, heard of it. It's a highly coveted piece of designer furniture. But is it useful? Yes, definitely. It's literally saved lives. This is a hammer you can find at any hardware store. Is it useful? Very much so. Is it beautiful? Uh, when viewed through the right lens, definitely. Uh, the hammer's bell and neck are elegantly tapered to minimize weight and maximize driving, driving force. The claw's V-shape makes it so you can pry out nails of many different sizes without any special attachments. And the handle is sculpted in such a way that it is both comfortable to grip and it is slip resistant. This is a CSS declaration of outline none applied to everything on a website. Uh, <laughs> Way back when, many print designers transitioned to web design and brought their biases with them, uh, codifying and perpetuating a lot of bad ideas. Uh, this includes writing CSS resets that globally removed all outlines uh, because there is the perception that they were ugly <laughs> when compared to the static layout you get with printed content. And while the web does borrow a lot from print, it isn't print, and we should stop thinking about it that way. Uh, many people rely on not having outlines removed uh, for reasons we'll get into in a bit. And for the record, I'd like to point out that uh, many CSS reset authors re later recanted this decision to remove outline styles from their resets after learning how important they were to the people that relied on them. Focus styles are commonly thought of as ugly, but I think that's we approach them. That's because we approach them with the wrong mindset. Uh, they're an integral part of the web, and we should treat them like such. A good link includes a good focus style to help the people who rely on them navigate. So what makes a good link? First, we write the word link. That clues us into what we're trying to do. We don't say click here because not everyone clicks things with mice. But the word link is pretty ambiguous when placed in the context of multiple links. So what you want to do is use a word or phrase that describes where activating the link will take you. Uh, in the context of a page, you begin to tell a story of where you can go and what you can expect to find when you get there. Uh, the text that describes the link is what we call an affordance. Affordances are hints about how something should be used. Think of them as little cheat sheets for operating things. Another common affordance we use for links is assigning them a color to distinguish them from the surrounding non-linked text. Blue is commonly understood as a link color because it is the color used for many browsers' fallback style sheets. Uh, this external consistency is a quick win for cognitive considerations. It's one less hurdle to overcome when first learning the ins and outs of an interface. But if you don't see color the same way other people do, this may prevent you from determining if the text is a link or not. To get around this, we add an underline to help distinguish what a link is. 
This affordance is as old as the internet itself. Uh, underlines equals links. If we're using a mouse or a trackpad, we want feedback to tell us we've successfully identified the link we want to activate. This communicates to the user that the cursor has been successfully placed on an area that can be interacted with. Removing the underline, when a, uh, removing the underline on a link when a cursor is hovering over it is a good way to indicate that. Uh, it doesn't rely on just color to communicate change. We also want to have a state that confirms that we've successfully activated this link in question. This reassures the person clicking on the link that something is actually going to happen after clicking on it. This is ideal for low power devices, low bandwidth situations, and or high server load scenarios where it might take some time for the site to deliver on your request. But how do we identify a link if we aren't using a cursor or a trackpad? We use a focus style, which is a visual indicator that works much like the hover style. Here we have successfully identified the link we want to activate via the tab key on a keyboard. Uh, the fallback style sheet that ships with every browser includes code for focus styles that appear if none is provided by the author. And this is important to note. This is a deliberate inclusion. Um, is, this deliberate inclusion is a recognition by browser manufacturers that people interact with web content in multiple ways. However, not all fallback browser focus styles are good enough to meet acceptable criteria for contrast as stipulated by the web content accessibility guidelines. Firefox in particular uses a tiny dotted outline. Uh, this might prevent low vision users from being able to perceive which link has been focused on, which isn't great. Uh, if they can't see if something has been identified, it will be tough, too impossible to know if they can activate it. What we can do is use CSS to override the browser's default focus style and create one that is uh, web content accessibility guidelines compliant. Here, I've turned the dotted outline into a solid blue outline using a color that matches the hyperlink color to further visually reinforce the fact that it's a link. We could also fill the background in on the link with blue and then update the text to be white. Now it's even more visually apparent. Uh, that's great for both biological and environmental low vision conditions, such as maybe looking at your phone outside in the bright light. You want to make sure each of your states is visually distinct and separate from the other states when styling an interactive element. Because each state is discrete, it allows us to more easily understand what's happening to it. Notice here that there's also a visited state uh, for links, which may not always be desirable. It's best to use a visited state when a link is in a coll larger collection used for task completion. Um, so examples of that might be navigating through training material content or through a table of contents. There's also some security cons considerations you'll need to take into um, factor in when you're styling your visited links, and that's just due to the nature of browsers and privacy. In a pinch, you can usually use your hover state for your focus state. Uh, combine the two selectors with a comma to save on both effort and file size. If there's one practical thing you can take away from this talk, it's that this little hack can go a long way to helping your users out. Uh, links aren't the only interactive element out there either. Uh, here's a button element, another workhorse of the modern user interface. You'll notice that the button has a disabled state and not a visited one. This is because a button is a trigger for an action, not a destination. Uh, disabling links is technically possible, but it can wreak havoc on, assist on assistive technology such as screen readers. It's best not to do it. Uh, I'm using also the uh, disabled HTML attribute as a CSS selector, meaning that appearance is tied semantically to state. So now we know why it's important to have all the states represented for our links and buttons and how to implement them. But interactive elements on the web aren't just limited to links and buttons. And this system of distinct and discrete visual treatments for state should be applied to anything a person can interact with. These other interactive elements are uh, links, buttons, selects, details, sometimes objects, and uh, input and text areas with an accompanying label element. Uh, these elements all constitute the basic building blocks of any modern robust design system. You should also make sure your focus styles work for things like links that wrap non-text content, including things like images. It doesn't have to be anything fancy, just make sure it's obvious. And of course, don't forget to provide an alternate description for those who may be unable to view your content. It's a myth that styling focus states is limited to just the outline property as well. Um, you have the full range of CSS to work with. Just make sure that when a state is styled, it is done so in such a way that it does not shift the page's layout around when activated. This is disorienting and can make a person lose their place. Um, I like to use properties like uh, box shadow, uh, color, background, uh, things that won't cause the, the browser to recalculate box sizes when triggered. 
And speaking of box shadows, one technique I especially like to use is the stacks box shadows effect to create a ring around an element that will honor its border radius. You'll notice that I'm removing I'm removing the oh, you'll notice that I'm removing the outline to get this effect. This is a situation where it's acceptable to remove the outline so long as the focus style you replace it with is distinct and passes acceptable color contrast criteria. However, people experiencing low vision conditions may use Windows high contrast mode to help them help them read. Uh, so it's good to check our styled states to see if they hold up. High contrast mode will strip away a lot of CSS, including box shadow. To get around this, I've used a high contrast mode media query to tweak the focus style to fill the button in instead. This could be helpful for people who are magnifying their screen as the focus effect is more pronounced and therefore easier to perceive. Um, alternate ways to identify and activate content aren't just limited to keyboards either. Uh, this is a switch which helps people with motor control issues operate technology. They're typically large hardware buttons that you can program to do different things. Uh, this is neither mouse nor keyboard interaction. It's binary input that can emulate other kinds of input. Focus styles aren't also just limited to assistive technology users either. Um, here I'm using the Apple TV remote to identify the title I want to activate. And we're also just not limited to focus selectors anymore either. Uh, the W3C has two new CSS properties for us to play with, uh, focus within and focus visible. Uh, focus within is a pseudo class that is activated when an element is focused or contains an element that is focused. Currently, the most recent versions of Firefox, Chrome, and Safari support it. And a practical example of how we could use it could be for a table whose cells contain links. With Focus Within, I'm able to highlight an entire table row when a link in one of its table cells has received focus. This is done entirely with CSS, something you could previously only accomplish with the help of JavaScript. Here's how it works. So we're looking at the table represented as a hierarchical tree in the document object model, or DOM for short. Focus within is declared on a parent node to the one that will receive focus events. In our example, that's the table row. When a focus event occurs on the link inside of a table cell, the event travels up the DOM tree until it hits the element that has focus within declared on it. Styling rules are then applied as the conditions required by focus within have been met. Note that if the browser does not support this selector and it is included in a list of other valid selectors, the entire group declaration will be ignored. So be sure to author your CSS with care and deliberation. Um, next, we're gonna talk about other people's opinions regarding focus styles and what we can do about them. Um, sometimes you're being a good ally and have a strong case for incorporating focus states into your site, but a less informed person can override you because they have more organizational clout. So what can we do about that? Focus visible is a pseudo class that is activated when an element is focused and a user agent determines via its heuristics the user's input modality. That's a fancy way of saying it shows focus styling when activated via input other than mouse cursor or finger tap. So say you have a link on a website and a person decides it's interesting and wants to read it. They identify the link. If focus visible is declared on it, the browser runs a bunch of logic to figure out what input the person is using. This allows us to create separate focus styles, one for cursor input and one for keyboard input. This allows us to create two separate modes for your website, one that is shown to mouse or trackpad users and one that is for everybody else. Currently, only Firefox supports it but we can get other browsers supporting it by using a polyfill, which is a technique that uses JavaScript to recreate a browser feature. Uh, but in addition to the extra data to download and maintenance concerns that come with introducing a polyfill, I'd like, to, I'd like you all to consider this. Can you trust your heuristics? Computers are awful at understanding the context of the real world. Here's Google's world-class algorithm having trouble telling the difference between dogs and fried chicken. And the web is more than just mice and keyboards. <coughs> We're seeing more and more devices with multimodal inputs becoming commonplace, meaning that a person might be switching input on the fly to best accomplish their task. For example, someone using the Microsoft Surface may at any point be using a mouse, a trackpad, touch, keyboard, stylus, gesture, or voice inputs. Form factor is also an unreliable metric, so device sniffing is out. 
Here's a uh, Gemini PDA, which is a clamshell Android smartphone with a full QWERTY keyboard. It's a delightful little mutant of a device, and I love it. <laughs> um, devices may also have their input augmented. The latest screen reader survey by WebAIM revealed that a total of 62% of all participants use an external keyboard in conjunction with their mobile device in some capacity. This should especially give us pause for concern about, um, assumption, about making assumptions about how people actually use their devices. Now let's talk about people. I have a lot of problems with identifying people as assistive technology users without their express <coughs> consent. I think the general idea behind Focus Visible is well-intentioned, but ultimately may be a slippery slope solution. The specific concerns I have aren't new, nor are they exclusive to just me. For starters, if you've spent any amount of time doing web development, you know that trying to make solutions based off of de detecting what the browser reports is an unsustainable nightmare. There's also the collecting, sharing, the collecting and sharing of personally identifying information. Um, Focus within can be used as a hook to try and identify people as assistive technology users without them expressly communicating that. Uh, from a technical perspective, this runs afoul of the same kind of problems device sniffing does. And regardless of its accuracy, who the hell knows what a person collecting this information is doing with it? Um, mass data breaches are also commonplace occurrences these days. Would you feel comfortable having this kind of information about you uh, sold to the highest bidder? Another big picture concern is if you don't check to see if your design solutions actually work the way you intended with the people that you're designing for. Uh, there's a whole host of biases, assumptions, and subtle nuance that silently worm their way into the design process, especially when it comes to designing for disability. And we should always be on guard to prevent that. Finally, um, this line of thinking is starting to creep back into a terrible trend of the early web, which was separate sites for assistive technology users. Um, <coughs> these sites didn't always have parity in information or capability compared to the sites that they were supposed to accompany, and oftentimes forced people to contact support if they needed assistance, which is an embarrassing act that diminishes personal autonomy. Uh, there's a reason you don't see these kinds of sites that much anymore, and that's simply because they don't work. People aren't binary about their skill in operating websites. When I'm healthy and working on my personal laptop, I can use Google Docs with ease. But I'm not that smart, so I'm gonna have to have some difficulty learning about differential calculus on Khan Academy. Maybe I'm traveling in a foreign country and need to get some kind of critical information, but I don't speak the language, have a limited data plan, and am jet lagged and sick from the long flight. Or maybe I'll just get old. Another way to put this, um, I tab through forums all the time. Am I an assistive technology user? Really, it's not about what, this, what a system identifies me as. It's about how well a system responds to who I am and what I experience when I use it. Because of this, what I'm asking you to do is embrace the unknown. Uh, focus styles are so baked into what the web is that we don't even consider it a unique standalone feature. If you're going to make a browser for mass consumption, it's simply part of the table stakes. We're not always using the latest device or the latest version of a browser either. If you're economically disadvantaged, unhoused, or live in an emerging market, you simply may not have access to a device capable of taking advantage of the latest technology. In fact, some people purchase and use devices that are no longer supported specifically because of the fact that it makes it affordable. These groups of users represent millions of people, uh, many, of whom, many of whom have never used the internet before. So should we turn our backs on them because of it? Browsers are eating the world, and we're going to keep finding them in places we never thought they'd be. So in closing, it's important to keep the following in mind. Good user experiences meet the user where they are, not where we hope they'll be. Thank you. <laughs>